My mother and I decided to visit Nevada City, California on a whim. It's an old-timey Victorian-era mining-slash-lodging town built in 1856. Look at pictures on Google if you really want to see a creepy town. It looks haunted without having to try. After eating lunch at a brew pub, we decided to stroll around the massive Pioneer Historical Cemetery on the outskirts of town. It wasn't quite dusk, but the trees are really tall in this area, so daylight is hard to gauge, and it usually feels later than it is. This cemetery was sprawling. I mean, most Pioneer cemeteries are, because of the high mortality rate of the time. Lots of kids' graves. As we progress through the cemetery, it starts like a proper cemetery with large ornate tombs and mausoleums, marble obelisks, family plots, and that kind of thing. But what's wild about the cemetery is that it stretches on almost forever into the woods. Spooky, but this isn't a paranormal story. As we follow the cemetery deeper and deeper into the woods, it becomes hard to tell what's a grave or not, and it's getting more wild and overgrown. It eventually devolved into just wilderness, with the occasional sign of homeless camps like abandoned tents, bags of trash, and all that. Luckily, the trees were opening up and more daylight was coming through. We ended up in an open area with a large solitary juniper tree, tall brush, and a few random graves. I sort of tripped over something, and it turned out to be a purse like a large designer purse, and it looked really old, kind of like it had been there for a while. Looking up from the purse about 10 yards ahead, I saw what looked like a pile of women's clothing, but then I noticed, to my horror, a tangled mass of hair, and I froze. You ever know something without actually knowing something? I knew that this was a dead woman's body, down to my core. I put a hand out and stopped my mom, who was trailing behind me. Get your phone out. Call the police. That's a dead body over there. And she immediately started dialing 911, because like me, she just knew. Then it gets bananas. As my mom and I are discussing the situation, we had our attention turned away from the corpse. When we looked back at the body, I swear to God... She was sitting up with her back turned to us. She was wearing a bright red trench coat and had really grimy blonde hair and was more standing up than laying on her shoulders. It was like the grime in her hair allowed it to defy gravity. Slowly, she turned her head over her shoulders like something out of a horror movie and spotted us. She literally jumped to her feet lightning fast and turned to face us. Her front was a mess of torn clothing and she was barely covered. In the weirdest gait I've ever seen, she rapidly advanced on us in a jerking, lurching fashion. Her hands were desperately trying to keep herself covered. My first thought was that she had been assaulted. She kept trying to speak, but it was like she couldn't form words, only make short, high-pitched squeaks. As she closed on me, she stopped and pointed down in excitement at the purse I tripped over. I asked if it was hers, and when I did, her expression changed into a horrible smirk. It still haunts me to this day. And suddenly, she was slowly starting to undress herself, and we had to shout to get her to stop. By this point, we'd heard the cops on the way. We said we'd found someone in serious distress, be that as it may, we both knew this was not a safe situation for us. We quickly backed away, turned, and booked it out of there. When we followed up with the police out of concern and morbid curiosity, they said whoever we found must have fled because they didn't find her. I hope to God she's okay and gets the help she needs. My mom was an avid conspiracy podcast listener when my brother and I were growing up. She used to listen to the Coast to Coast podcast on alien conspiracies and would talk about recent UFO sightings and stuff like that. Anyway, because of this, 
my mom decided to tell my dad, my brother, and me an incredibly secret one-word code that would only be used to verify that we are who we say we are. In case of time travel or something like that, it's a pretty unique word that's almost inconceivable to be mentioned in regular conversation. We all thought it was pretty corny, but we all agreed to remember it and all of us talk about the code in conversation every once in a while. Take note that my mom came up with this code several years after we moved away to a different state from our hometown. Fast forward to last week. A tradition of our family is to go back to our hometown for Thanksgiving every year, and my dad's and uncle's birthday is within that week, so we usually celebrate their birthday during this week as well. We decided, since it was my father's 50th birthday, that we'd go to a dive bar with my family and my parents' high school friends. Vibes were great, and it was the first time our whole family had been out together for several years. About an hour in, a late 60s to early 70s man, wearing a bar staff shirt, came up to me, my brother, and my mom, and said this incredibly secret, aforementioned family code. The way he said it was so deliberate. It was like he knew how much the code meant to my family. We all looked at each other with very perplexing gazes. It was like all of us wanted to say, what the fuck to each other. But as soon as we looked at each other, he went over to where he was sitting prior to this incident. My brother went over to talk to him a few minutes later, but I forget what he had said to him. Later that night, he and my dad were outside smoking and he gave my dad a rock. It was a dark brown rock with dark orange streaks passing through it. I think my dad gave it to my mom and my mom threw it away. My mom believed that the rock was some sort of bad omen. I shit you not, this really did happen. My brother and I think it's a clear prank that my mom has pulled, but she usually cracks when this happens, and we asked her a few times. I wouldn't think she would have joked about this in the first place, but it's the only logical thing that we could possibly come up with. Even the day following, my brother and I asked my mom about the incident again, and she remained very adamant about her having no involvement in this. My dad isn't the prank-pulling kind of guy and wasn't even there to see it go down, so this eliminates him from doing something like this. We asked him anyway, and to no surprise, he said he had no involvement. I know this seems incredibly unbelievable, and I agree, it totally does, but it did happen, and it's the creepiest interaction we'll likely never forget. I'm not a believer in the supernatural, but if I did think this was just a prank, I wouldn't have spent so much time talking about it. I live in a flat building in a good area. It's a long, windy cul-de-sac, so there's not many cars coming in or out, unless it's people leaving or coming home from work. My boyfriend's away in Thailand for a month, and we usually take the dog out together at night. I went by myself, which I was fine with. I usually feel safe. Last week, around 8pm, I left the flat to take my dog out for the bathroom. My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. She had just had her space surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I'm waiting for my dog to do her business, and a car pulls in and drive slowly past me. The guy did a friendly, neighborly nod towards me, so I did a smile back. You know, to be polite. The guy parks at the front of the building, and I'm at the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog, trying to get her to hurry because it was freezing. I look up, and the man is stood outside his car, staring at me. Freaked out by this, I turn my attention back to my dog. I keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring at me with a creepy ass smile on his face. I looked away again for a second and he was walking along the road slowly towards us. I'm a really friendly person, I can be paranoid and aware, as any woman should be at night, but something about him made me feel scared. He's walking so slow, as if he wants to talk to me. 
So I hide behind a van and I'm telling my dog, hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore, which terrified the life out of me. All I hear are footsteps coming toward us. The guy peeks his face around the van and my dog goes nuts. She's jumping around, barking aggressively, and that guy doesn't take that as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that she doesn't want his presence, but even though she's doing this, he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and ask him to please leave us as she's just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet, sinister voice, he asks, What's your name? I couldn't really hear him. He kept repeating the question. I eventually understood what he was asking. My dog is still going absolutely nuts at him. I say again, Please, my dog's just had surgery. You need to walk away, she's too excited. Ignored again. He continues walking towards us, asking my name. So I start walking away from him. He ponders for a minute, still smiling, and he eventually backs up slowly, still facing me. I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds. He walks back to his car, looking over his shoulder at me, then stands with his back to his car and stares at me for another three minutes. I pretend my dog is doing something, when she's really just being a pain in the ass and just standing there. I look up and he's gone. I'm shaking, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on. She's telling me, just go inside, but she doesn't realize I'm frozen in fear. Eventually, I see a woman and her son rock up to the front door, so I half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. The front of the building has glass doors. I glance in and the man is standing there, waiting for us. I told the woman, this man has been following me and my dog. I'm scared. And she walks in with me. This man sees I'm not alone and walks right past us out of the building. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock the doors. I decide to tell my two male neighbors about it, as my boyfriend's away, and they agree to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration plate, as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work, and I want her to be wary of him. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11am, just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building, and as we're heading to the lift, I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He was looking for me. He started walking towards me. At first, I didn't recognize him, but then he smiled this creepy smile, and I realized who it was. He said hi, so I said hi, then I beelined it for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I pressed the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me. Again, my dog is going nuts at him. He asks what my name was. He had an accent. He asked again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, what? My dog's name or mine? Yours, he says. I froze and said a fake name. He started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention. The lift was about to open and I could run away. He told me his name. It's nice to meet you, I replied and finally the lift doors opened. I walked in and pressed the button to my floor, hoping he'd leave me alone. He ran behind me as I walked in. I'd like to see you again, he said. What the fuck? Shivers ran down my spine, I was so creeped out. I replied that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. As I said this, the lift doors were closing and he tried to stick his hand out to stop the lift from closing. Thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was afraid he was going to run up as he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get into my home and lock the doors. The lift opens and he's not there, so I beeline it to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs, and I swear I thought I saw someone coming up. I ran in and locked the front door. 
I was so confused by what just happened. The next thing I do, I message everyone with the update. They told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on record, so I did that. And the police arrived at my flat at 3pm. I explained everything to them, and they said I could either A. Get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off, or B. Next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone. And if he doesn't, phone the police as it would then be considered harassment. But for now, the police couldn't do more, which is fair enough. I didn't want to anger him at this stage as it's not a crime at this point, but why can't he just leave me alone? I've clearly shown I'm not interested. It just annoys me so much I can't even leave my house looking ugly as hell without someone being desperate for any female in the immediate area. I hate saying something's going on when it maybe isn't, but I just have a terrible gut feeling. I hadn't seen the guy in a few days, however I saw him today. I again was taking my dog out to the bathroom at around 1pm. As soon as I left the main door, I look and the guy is sitting in his car. He clocked me. I started walking past his car when he got out and said hi to me. I completely ignored him and walked on by. I was preparing myself to shout at him if he kept on following or talking to me. I went over to the grass and the guy is standing at his car, staring again. I'm a bit further away, so I text my sister, letting her know that he was at his car watching me. She didn't reply, so I phoned one of my male neighbors and he quickly got his shoes on and said he was coming down the stairs. I look back at the man, and it seems as though he has his phone out, recording me. I started shaking, working myself up to the point of confronting him and telling him to leave me alone. Next thing I know, my sister bolts out of the building and fast walks over to me and my dog. She said as soon as she came out of the building, she saw him back inside his car, with the car door fully open. His back was turned to her because he was watching me. This time she witnessed it. He looked at her briefly and watched her walk over to me. He started staring at us both. That's when my male neighbor got outside and walked over to us. The man continued watching as I told them both I think he was waiting for me to go back into the building. Because why was he just standing there? My sister had enough of it. So she told me and my neighbor to take the dog for a walk, and she stormed over to the guy's car. Excuse me, she said, and he was shocked. She stood right in front of his car and explained that he needed to leave me alone. I'm not interested, and that I told him the dog had surgery and he wouldn't leave, which is unacceptable. She also said that I'd mentioned about my boyfriend, so he needs to leave me alone. He just nodded and mumbled a few times. She said he looked frightened. She walked back into the building, so we took the dog for a walk and when we got back, he was gone. He probably got out of his car and ran back to his flat. I mean, he made me uncomfortable, so she did it to him. Now, if anything else happens, I'm phoning the police, as they said it would be harassment. So this happened over the weekend while I was home from college for my mom's birthday. On Saturday night, I had a couple of beers with my girlfriend, who was spending the week at our house because my parents are really chill. At about 12.30pm, a few minutes after my parents went to bed, I went out to the back porch to grab a couple more beers for myself and my girlfriend. I opened the back door and stepped onto the back porch. Immediately the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end and I felt like I was being watched from the tree line. I thought nothing of it at first because I always feel a little spooked going outside at night, but as I opened the cooler, I heard it. In my mind, it was unmistakable. The agonizing screams of what sounded like my next door neighbor and her teenage daughter. What's even more terrifying is that I swear they were screaming a very specific thing. Sam. Help us, please, Sam. That's my name. 
Now I was drunk and already on edge, so frankly I turned around without the beers and locked the door behind me as I went back inside. Then I heard my mom's voice calling from upstairs, asking me if I'd heard it. I responded yes and asked if she knew what it was. She didn't have a clear answer, only speculation, but she knew for a fact that our neighbors were both inside their home. Yesterday, while returning home from work, I was exhausted and straight from my routine way back home. I decided to sit down on a bench at a small park. The park was empty at the time. About five minutes later, a young man dressed in a business suit holding a briefcase sits down on the bench across from me and started to occasionally stare at me. Later on, he got up and sat next to me on the bench and said, How are you, Jennifer? Now, Jennifer is not my first name, but I'll use it as a placeholder. He had a British accent and he was speaking in a very exaggerated manner. I was surprised and thought this was someone from my college or high school that I did not remember at the time. And when I asked how he knew my name, he simply replied, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then he put his briefcase on his lap and collapsed his hands on top of it. At this point, I started to feel worried and asked him again how he knew me. But before I could finish my sentence, he interrupted me and said, I will get into that in a little while. But first, let me ask you, are you satisfied with where you're living right now? And then he said my entire address. What are your thoughts on your workplace? Are you satisfied with your wage? He asked me and then he correctly stated my wage. At this point, I started to get really creeped out by him and asked him who he was again. He calmly replied, It does not matter at this point. Right now, what matters is that I want to help you. He then went on to state a lot of personal information about me that I thought no one would ever know. He especially knew a lot about my personal relationships about people that I know. As he was saying all of this stuff, I started to pack my things and got up from the bench. I asked once more who he was and what he wanted in a worried manner. He didn't answer me and told me to calm down. I then yelled at him, asking what the fuck he wanted from me and who he was. He didn't say anything and then did this weird thing where he rolled his eyes and then slowly turned his head around as if someone was standing behind him. And he just said, very well then. The way he did that was very strange. It was like he was a character giving the camera a side eye and breaking the fourth wall. He picked up his briefcase, got up from the bench and started to approach me. I tried to reach for the pepper spray in my bag but he grabbed my arm and said, no need for that. He pushed me away and I lost my balance and fell to the ground. He then quickly walked away. I was really scared after falling to the ground and I didn't know what to do for a solid minute. When I got back up, I went the way he walked, but I didn't see him and decided to just get out of the park and go home. Overall, his mannerisms were very strange and he used his hands in an elegant manner a lot when he talked, like as though he was a theatrical actor. And as I stated before, he spoke in a British accent but it was very theatrical as well. He was tall, very well-dressed, clean-shaven, had short, slicked hair, and was wearing circular glasses. Another detail that I noticed was that he had a square pin on the lapel of his blazer. The pin was white and it had a little black trident on it. I haven't gone to the police yet. I intend to ASAP, but I really don't know what to say or... What evidence to provide, apart from a small wound on my hand? I work part-time at a small business in my local mall and usually work alone. 
I'm a sales associate, so I'm required to talk to customers and encourage them to buy things. It was the last hour of my shift when a creepy man came in. He was about mid-forties and everything about him was odd. He originally asked a pretty standard question about a less expensive item that I happily answered. After this, though, he continued to ask questions almost as if he wanted to keep my attention to him. He then asks if he can try out our most expensive item in the store, which is a massage chair. I say yes. At this point, I just thought he was an innocent yet socially awkward guy. He gets in the chair to try it out and continues to ask unusual questions. We chit-chat a bit and I tell him the massage chair's features and the price of it. All of a sudden, the questions get more personal. He asked what high school I went to and if I missed it. Me, being naive, I said the high school I went to and that I did not miss going. He said some story about a teacher I've never heard of and said he missed school a lot. He asked if I lived around there, to which I avoided the question, but implied that I lived close. He then repeatedly asked me the price of the chair and asked me to calculate the price along with our second most expensive item in the store. I thought he was fully interested and I was convinced he was about to buy it. He kept insisting that he needed to walk out with the chair today and that he has a truck that's big enough to hold it. It seemed I'd finally answered his questions to his liking because I was able to walk away. He then made a phone call and started describing how I look, my age, where I live approximately, and what store I worked at. He then said to the person on the phone, We got one. We got one. I had suspicions that he was creepy, but this confirmed it. I asked him from behind the cashier's counter, You're not talking about me, right? He shook his head no. He then stood up from the chair and said he will not be buying the chair today. I was so scared and alone. No one else around but me and him. I ran to the back and grabbed all my stuff and pulled out my pocket knife. He then left the store and hung out right outside the only entrance and exit. I didn't want to leave, but I couldn't stay inside the mall. I waited for him to get out of sight and then quickly locked the store doors and ran outside to my car. I called my manager and she said I have to close the store properly, so she told me to go into a nearby store in the mall and call a security escort. I did that. I was escorted back to the store to close up and was escorted back to my car with no further incident. I'm going to tell you this strange episode from my childhood. I was like 9 or 10 years old. I used to go to school on my own, just walking. It wasn't that far, maybe like 10 minutes. Every day I went the same way. It was the shortest, but it was kind of isolated. I was walking alone, as always, when I noticed a police car coming on my left. There was a middle-aged man, obviously a policeman, who slowed down and started talking to me. He said something like, Hey kid, are you going to school? And I said yes. He kept driving near me and asking me if I wanted to get in the car so he could take me to school faster. I said no, and that my mom always told me not to talk to strangers. He said, I'm not a stranger. I'm a policeman. You can trust me. I thanked him and told him there was no problem because the school wasn't that far. He insisted. So he sped up a bit, went in front of me and opened the car door. Come on, it'll be fun to take a ride in the police car. It's almost every child's dream. That's when I said again, no, please leave me alone. He kept the car door open, staring at me. And then I started to walk faster until I went into a little street and then started running to the point I didn't even see the car behind me. I was shocked. I was pretty young, you know. The policeman had a weird smile. It was really disturbing, like it was unnatural. Since that day, I never took that way again, and my mom started to come with me for the first few mornings. I still don't know what he wanted, or if he had good intentions, or just taking advantage of the fact he was a policeman, so kids would trust him easily. 
I'm happy, though, that I never discovered it on my own. Who knows? I met my dad at a tire shop in an increased crime area of town. I'm not really sure why we went to this shop. It was probably around noon. My dad brought his chihuahua with him, so I took her on a walk around the tire shop while he consulted with the mechanics. The shop was about half a football field away from a busy street, with a big field in between the shop and the street, in an otherwise residential area. I figured it was safe enough to walk the dog around in, because my dad and the mechanics were right there. However, the shop was fenced in and not facing the field, so I guess it actually wasn't that safe, because my dad and the employees couldn't see me. So... I was just walking the little dog around in this field, not too close to the busy street. And suddenly, this beat-up car with the windows down starts driving really slowly on the busy street. I can tell the guy driving was staring at me. The street is somewhat far away from me, and he eventually drives past. So in my mind, I think, okay, whatever. But then a couple seconds later, I see the car going down the street again, but in the opposite direction. He was going fast. He then turns onto the street that I'm on. He was speeding and very erratic, and he just guns it into the field where I'm walking the dog. I mean, he literally jumps the curb, coming straight for me at a fast speed. I'm just shocked. I think to myself, is he about to plow us down? What the fuck is happening? It was just so quick and unexpected. In my confused shock, I just hesitated with the dog, contemplating running away, but also not wanting to turn my back to the car. Then, miraculously, I guess there was some kind of uneven ground or a hole, because this guy's car got stuck and a wheel started spinning. With his windows down, I can hear him cursing. I take this moment to scoop up the dog, and just about run out of there. Then he opens the car door, about to get out of the car. I can't remember anything about this guy other than he was quite overweight. Again, because of the shock, I can't remember anything else. Right at that moment, a truck pulls up beside us, with two youngish men inside of it. It was a construction truck. They rolled down the windows and asked if the guy is bothering me. They say it loudly. It spooked the guy and he goes back into his car. He's then able to peel out in reverse from whatever hole the car was stuck in. He very quickly gets out of the field and back onto the street and takes off. The kind men who stopped apparently saw all this happen. It just happened so quickly. They were just as confused as I was. What was this guy's game plan? What was he attempting? Kidnapping me in broad daylight, obviously with people around. I'm not sure. I'm so glad his car got stuck and I didn't find out. It was just very strange. I'm grateful his car got stuck and those guy drove by and stopped, and that they were willing to check out the situation. We chatted for a second after the guy left, and we were all very confused about what had happened. I can be overconfident at times about my safety. But after a handful of other strange, potentially dangerous encounters, I've learned to always be alert. Bad things can happen anytime and anywhere. Oh, and try not to freeze in a fight or flight situation. So many times I've frozen instead of fighting or fleeing. Thankfully my guardian angels have my back, but I won't take them for granted. This happened around 10 years ago now. I was around 13 to 14 and pretty small at the time. It was during the winter period, so at the time I was coming home from extra scholar activities. It was already dark at around 6pm. I stepped off the bus and still had a 5 minute walk. However, the area we were living in wasn't the best, and my older brother always told me to hold my keys in hand, ready to protect myself. 
three keys between my fingers, like I'd be Wolverine or some shit like that. I saw a guy walking toward me, but he didn't really raise any red flags. It was just a guy walking home. He didn't look at me or speed up when he saw me. Nothing. After he passed me though, he grabbed me by the jacket and threw me on the floor. He was quite a big guy, while I could compare my weight to an oversized chicken. The guy starts kicking me and punching me, and after the initial shock, I did the only thing that came into my head. Pulled the keys out of my pocket and stabbed him with all my strength in his thigh. One key went right in. He screamed in pain and fell to the ground. I used this opportunity to get the hell out of there. After two minutes of sprinting, I was home, bleeding from my face and crying. I told my parents everything. We went back to where he grabbed me, but there was only some blood on the floor, but no sign of him. We reported the incident to the police and never heard anything back from them. My parents decided to buy me a pocket knife after that, and my older brother got me a better one which I still have, and it's pretty cool. Before my dad went to prison, he was a dealer of narcotics of varying kinds. I remember moving across the Dallas Metroplex from one hot house to the next. Eventually, his life of crime caught up with him, and he was sentenced to 20 years behind bars, just a month shy of my fifth birthday and first days of school. I guess it was about eight months prior to his incarceration that the following event transpired. Now, before going any further, I should say that my dad was rather braggadocio with his behavior. He had a small group of loudmouth cronies that leached off of him, and he was never shy about flaunting his money. I guess in hindsight, he would have realized the target he was putting on his back, but in the moment, he was living too large to care. The night in question, I remember vividly in detail. It was chilly out, and the heater inside wasn't doing a good job to quell my shivers. As such, I was wearing a coat and bundled beside my mother on the sofa in the living room, which sat on the wall adjacent the front door. My middle brother, who was nearly two at the time, was on the carpet in front of us, playing with toys. And my dad was on the other end of the couch, counting what seemed to be a large stack of hundred dollar bills. My mother was telling me a fairy tale that she was making as she went along, and I was rubbing her belly as she was currently pregnant with who would eventually be my youngest brother. All of a sudden, there were booms coming from the front door. The front door to my right is kicked from its hinges, and three men in ski masks bust through its empty frame. Guns drawn, they began shouting orders. Get on the ground. Get on the fucking ground. Everything started spinning, and time seemed to slow as my young mind tried to grasp what was happening. One man stood watch, pistol pointing toward us. As the other two ransacked the house, looking for my dad's stash. Frustrated from a fruitless search, they trounced back into the living room and grabbed my pregnant mother by the arm and pulled her into the hall. They were screaming at her to tell her where the goods were, and through sobs, she informed that there was a safe in the bathroom. They made her lead them to the keys and back to the safe, where, at gunpoint, they forced her to open it. Unfortunately, her hands had begun to tremble, and as a result, she wound up dropping the key down into the air vent below. Infuriated, the masked man behind her bashed the top of her head with the butt of his pistol, causing her to faint from the impact. The injury she suffered still haunts her today, in the form of seizures and a paralyzed left side of her face. The next thing I see is the man violently dragging her by the hair out of the bathroom and straight into our playroom at the end of the hall. The other two men corral my father, brother, and I up off the living room floor and attempt to lead us to the same place as my now unconscious mother. However, my brother was screaming, terrified, and didn't understand what was happening. The same man who drug my mom up stomped up to him 
and once again took a fistful of hair and proceeded to roughly yank him into the room with us. They had us all lay face down on the hard wood and left the room as they turned their attention to the safe, occasionally stepping back in to ensure we were obeying their commands and to remind us not to fucking move. I remember not being scared anymore. I saw my power wheels truck behind me and thought that maybe I could run them over with it. I didn't realize the gravity of it all and the very real possibility they could kill us. I was in one of those throes of ignorant blissful thoughts that my father, who had guns planted all over the house, jumped up and ran out into the hallway. Pop, pop, pop. I heard gunfire exchanging as it moved to the other end of the hall and out into the front yard, and then silence. I didn't move, other than to shake my mom who was coming too. It was at this point that the fear finally hit me. Mom, wake up. I think dad got shot. I think he got killed. I cried. A moment later though, after what seemed to be hours, my dad emerged unharmed in the playroom door and told us it was safe to get up. The police came soon after, reports having been filed by neighbors who heard the gunfire. My dad was arrested for the small amounts of narcotics that the now open safe still contained. The police also found one of the robbers badly injured a couple of streets over on somebody's front lawn. He died that night in a hospital. But when his identity was revealed, it came as a shock. He was the brother of one of my dad's best friends. When my dad returned to jail, word from within his circle that one of the other men had in fact been his friend and that he was swearing revenge for his brother all up and down the neighborhood where we used to live. At the same time, my dad was vehemently looking for him to return the sentiment. Luckily though, they never found each other, and my dad was arrested for a less serious crime than murder shortly thereafter. But I never knew what happened to those two other men that held us up that night, and God willing, I never will. So, to the men who cowardly robbed us and permanently scarred my mother, for my sake and yours, let's not meet. Some few months ago, a friend of mine in the Navy was given orders to be stationed in Virginia. She had attempted for a while to find a renter for her house, but she was unsuccessful. Still hopeful, she offered to let me stay at the place for free if I help find a renter and keep maintenance on the place. Additionally, she had to leave one of her cats behind since she had no room to take it. Originally, I was pretty excited to live in a house for free. I live in the barracks and it can get cramped being in a small room with another person, so I accepted. When I got to the place, however, I was very disappointed. The house was large, but holy hell, it was trashed. There was junk all over the place, dust covered everything, fleas were everywhere, and it definitely smelled like cats lived there. This was pretty surprising to me, since my friend seemed like she was a pretty clean person. I was sadly mistaken. Still, I stayed a bit hopeful. It would be simple to get some friends together to clean up the place and make it comfortable. I helped her finish packing and we sat around and chatted for a bit. That's when she told me about her ex. He was army, like me, but in a different unit than mine. Originally, he'd been charming according to her, but he'd become unstable to her for whatever reason. When she called it off and told him that he had two weeks to leave, he became insufferably annoying and childish, hiding her boots, terrorizing the cats leaving the place a mess, and was parking his car behind her so she couldn't leave without pitching a fit. He eventually did leave, and that was the end of it, apparently. After she left, I pretty much stayed away from the place until the scheduled day for me and my buddies to clean up, dropping by every day to clean the cat box and feed the cat. One night, however, after dinner with a friend of mine, 
she offered to tag along with me to go feed the cat. She was one of the people that agreed to help clean, so I figured it'd be good to let her see the place to plan out what needed to be done. When we got to the house and stepped out, I remember hearing a loud rustling coming from the surrounding trees. I figured it was an animal. As I think back on it, and it could have been my memory just making the situation worse, but it is a pretty big part of the memory. As I walked up to the door, I felt incredibly uneasy, like something was wrong and that I shouldn't be there. But I didn't want to waste my friend's time, so I shrugged it off. I was a bit confused when I went to unlock the door as well. The bolt lock was a bit finicky and sometimes wouldn't unlock properly, so I often had to unlock it multiple times. That is, turn the lock, try to open the door, and so on until it actually unlocked. This time, however, the door opened after the first turn. At the time, I mostly figured it was just luck, but in the back of my mind, I pondered whether or not I'd forgotten to lock it to begin with. Either way, after entering, I was about to head upstairs to feed the cat, but when I attempted to flick on the lights in the entryway, only one of the two lit up. The other one didn't. I assumed it must have blown out, but when I stepped closer to see, I stepped in a small puddle of water, catching myself off guard. Upon closer inspection, I discovered that the light fixture was completely filled with water and some leak from wherever was dripping water onto the floor. Additionally, I heard a light rumble that, at the time, I assumed was the AC. I knew the AC was right above the entryway on the top floor, so I thought maybe it was faulty or had broken and was leaking. Great, I thought. More issues to address. Still, I was there for a purpose, so I told my friend to check out the place to get an idea of what supplies we might need to clean it while I went upstairs to feed the cat. However, before I even was halfway up the stairs, my friend called me back down. She was standing in the kitchen by the back door that led to the porch, and glass from the shattered door window littered the floor. She asked if it had been like that when I'd last left the place, but I could have sworn that it wasn't like that when I'd left. After all, I'd only been to the place once or twice since the owner had left, and I was sure that a shattered window would have caught my eye. Judging by the placement of the glass, it had definitely been shattered from the outside. What was strange, however, was that the door was still locked. I'm not sure if anyone was in the house. I told my friend to stay there while I checked upstairs. I had no weapons on me, and I doubt the place had any guns. But funnily enough, my friend was really into sword collecting, and many of them were downstairs. So I picked one up and tiptoed upstairs, hoping my childhood memories of stick fighting could possibly help me. Luckily, no one was in the house, but just to be sure, we both waited outside while we called the cops. After calling the police, I called up the owner and told her everything that had happened. The obvious break-in was very strange, nothing was stolen, and the place wasn't in any worse state than when I'd left it. The only things out of place were the broken door window, that same door still being locked, and the possibly unlocked front door. At the time, I assumed that the water was not associated with the break-in, because of all this evidence, we assumed that my friend's ex had done it, since it seemed that he either was looking for something specific or just wanted to be destructive and probably hadn't even entered the house. According to my friend, he knew that she was gone, but didn't know that anyone was watching the place, so he likely thought the place was fair game for just vandalizing it. Still, beyond the window, I nor the police found anything else, that night anyway. After this event, I, of course, was still very uneasy about going back to the place. I'd never dealt with a break-in before, and the then assumption that her ex was just being a dick and lightly vandalized the place definitely made me not want to stay there for too long, for the fear that I might be around when he next decided to come back. Still, the damn cat was still there. 
I couldn't just let it start. So while the police were tracking down the proposed suspect, and the insurance company were getting information, I still had to go to the place to feed the cat. I couldn't keep it with me because the barracks don't allow pets, and I had no friends that were willing to take it in. I won't lie, I waited a couple of days to go back to that house. I had to work up the courage. I didn't even live there and the prospect creeped me out, so I can only imagine how I'd feel if it had been my place. Still, the cat needed to be fed, so off I went. When I walked in, the first thing that had hit me was the smell. Mildew and mold, obviously. My barracks were loaded with it, but it was strong enough to overpower even the cat smell. The water leak had become even worse. The hardwood floor of the entryway had begun to warp and the ceiling was drooping. Something definitely wasn't right. It hit me that this leak was much more serious than I first assumed. This definitely wasn't an AC issue. The roaring could still be heard too. Curious now, and not as panicky as my last venture into the house, I made my way upstairs, sword in hand. At the top of the stairs, there's a short hallway that leads to the master bedroom. Along the way, there's a storage closet. When I passed the closet, my foot made an audible squelch. There was water here too, which made sense as it was pretty much directly above the entryway, and both the AC and water heater were in the back of the closet. When I entered the master bedroom, however, there was no water. But the roaring sound was louder and it sounded more distinct and familiar now. Running water, like what you'd hear from a bathtub. Sure enough, I discovered a door at the back of the bedroom that I hadn't noticed before. It led to a half bath with a toilet and sink, and in that room was another door. Sure enough, the noise was definitely a running faucet. The carpet in front of that door was soaked beyond belief, and the door was locked. Judging by the placement of the door, the room beyond would have shared a wall with the storage closet, and the tub would literally be right above the house's entryway. That would explain the weird water-filled light fixtures, the drooping ceiling, and the leak. At first, I figured I might as well bust down the door, since it was obvious that the tub had long since overflown, and the water damage would already be a nightmare to fix. A broken door would be the least of the owner's worries. I stopped myself though. I didn't know what I'd find behind that door, and I didn't want to go in blindly, so I decided to call the police again to get an officer to help instead. He was able to unscrew the knob and get it open. Nothing was behind the door, but sure enough, the tub had been running and it overflowed. We turned it off, and the officer added more things to the report that had already been open about the previous incident. Putting this all together, I think it's pretty safe to assume what happened. The vandal, almost certainly the owner's ex, had broken in that night probably just before my friend and I arrived. He'd broken into the place from the back door by smashing the window, and had likely left through the front door, which was why it was unlocked. Now, I'm not 100% sure if this next part was during his original break-in or if he came back later to do it, but I think that while he was in the house, he went upstairs, plugged the bathtub, turned the water on, and rigged the door. The vandal obviously wasn't there to steal anything. Instead, he just wanted to flood the house because he knew the owner would be away and that water damage is a nightmare to deal with. I'm pretty sure that he did all this in the same night and that neither the police nor I had discovered the water until a couple days after, which would explain the leak I discovered the night of the break-in. Whatever the case, whoever did it is a vindictive piece of garbage, if you ask me. I'm not sure if they ever caught him or anything, or really about anything that ever happened, although I know that the cat ran away through the broken window. I gave the key to the insurance people, and decided never to go back to the place. Last I heard, she found some new tenants for the place, and it's been fixed up pretty well with no further issues.
March 1996. I'm 16 and joined the British Army. When you join the armed forces in the UK, you start with 10 weeks in basic training. I attended Purbright training camp for what I thought would be the worst part of army training. I couldn't be more wrong. No, back then I was really fit and very happy-go-lucky. I took to the training even though it was incredibly tough. There was horrible accommodation, bad food, and we were run ragged from 4am to 9pm every single day. But I got through and passed. I still remember my passing out parade and how proud my mom was watching me in my uniform marching around. After you finish the hell of boot camp, you go on to phase two, which is your trade training, which depending on what you chose would decide on where you went. For me as a chef was St. Omar Barracks in Aldershot. However, until your phase two training started, everyone, no matter the trade, went to Deep Cut Barracks, a delightful camp about a mile from Purbright, so it was only just down the road. Initially, I was very excited to be leaving basic training. After all, the food was better, you could have duvets on your bed, and the regime was nowhere near as strict as Purbright. When you first arrive, you are all put into a new arrivals building, sharing a room with ten others until they decided what platoon you went to. So I settled in for my first night. I knew a few of my roommates from my training platoon. My very first night, I got a glimpse into the realities of what Deep Cut was. I woke up at about 1am because I needed the bathroom. Upon getting to the door, before I could open it, two guys in gas masks carrying pillowcases barged into the room. They ran straight for the far bed and proceeded to batter the lads sleeping in the bed with what looked like, from the outline of it, helmets in their pillowcases. After watching this, stunned, I thought I should get help, and it was then that I noticed the corporal who was in charge of us that night was holding the door open for the two guys. He looked hammered and was in hysterics at what was unfolding. The assault lasted for probably 30 seconds before they ran out, followed by the corporal at the door and I could hear them pissing themselves with laughter as they ran down the stairs. After helping the battered lad to the bathrooms, I watched him clean himself up and neither of us said anything and the guy looked about my age, 16. What could we do if one of the people in charge was basically behind this? And the next few days, I came to realize this camp was basically where sergeants, corporals, and officers went if they'd failed in their career or for a punishment. What better people to look after two to three hundred young, impressionable soldiers, all between the ages of 16 to very early 20s? They got drunk and did things to us for their own amusement. I had the hope and knowledge it would be okay. You normally spend one or at most two weeks here. I would be out of here soon. Day three. I got called into the sergeant's office. He explained due to the fact that they're so short of army chefs, I had to wait at deep cut for enough chefs to pass basic training before going on to my next phase. After asking how long, Three months was the reply. Three months at this hellhole. I thought it couldn't get any worse. I was very, very wrong. At this stage, I got introduced to my platoon while I was at Deep Cut by my brand new platoon sergeant. He initially sounded very friendly and spoke with a soft Sunderland accent. He started by laying down ground rules for cleaning and such. It was at this point he warned us about his evil twin. We all laughed, but he wasn't joking. He said if we came across his twin, it wouldn't end well for us and left us at that. After speaking to a few of the lads that had been there a week or so, they reiterated the warning along with, do not get on Sergeant G's radar, just keep your head down. It was at this point I began hearing rumors of the suicide of a soldier and the involvement of Sergeant G. Apparently he'd made this soldier the target of his evil twin and made his life in utter misery, tormenting him whenever he could. It was a few days after that I personally witnessed the evil twin in action. Myself and a few lads were in our room when a pigeon flew in through the open window. 
After several hilarious attempts to shoo the bird out, we failed, and the pigeon carried on flying around and landing on lockers. This was when Sergeant G enters the room and asks what's going on. After explaining about the pigeon, he then says, I will show you how to catch him. He then proceeds to jump from the beds into the air in an attempt to catch the bird. At first, this was hilarious. We were all laughing, even Sergeant G. That is until it went on for at least 30 minutes more. He just didn't stop. He was relentless. The poor pigeon, probably scared to death at this point, got himself caught by Sergeant G. Now what happened next you may think is bullshit, but I can swear to this and will always remember the moment. Sergeant G put the pigeon's head in his mouth and bit it clean off. He then spat the head out onto one of the beds and threw the body out of the window. Stunned by this, we just stood there while the demented Sergeant G kept saying, Evil Ed's had his dinner, and laughing. While this is probably the most psychotic event I witnessed, the sheer cruelty of Sergeant G was legendary. One day in the height of summer, he made us push a huge temporary road around a field barehanded. If you've never seen one of these, it's basically a gigantic roll of rubber and steel. Being jet black and being in the sun all day, this thing was incredibly hot. So hot, in fact, all of our palms and fingers turned into one huge blister on each hand. After inspecting the damage to our ravaged hands, he shouted at us for not having men's hands. Not satisfied with this, he ordered us to grab a huge rope from the back of a Land Rover and ordered us to have a tug of war with this rough strip of rope until the blisters all tore off of our hands. The pain of the raw flesh of our hands was incredible especially when he then ordered us to do press-ups on the hot concrete afterwards. It was also the time the booster injection they gave everyone became infected in a few of us. Sergeant G's evil twin made it his mission to find out who had an infected booster site and would punch them in the sight as hard as he could. To this day, I still carry the scar after he exploded my infection injection and of course made me do press-ups after while the blood and pus poured down my arm. He would do things like hide under the beds like a real-life boogeyman, waiting to see if anyone would dare talk to him about it. Or he would hide in unlocked or empty lockers and do the same. The man was a lunatic for sure. While at Deep Cut, time went slowly. It was boring. All we had to do was whatever the delightful training staff could dream up for us. One day, the lieutenant in charge announced we were going on exercise for two nights and three days in the woods around Sandhurst. On the morning of the exercise, Sergeant G gathered everyone on parade to get everyone organized and announced on the exercise some of his SAS mates might take an appearance and interrogate people during the exercise. I didn't think much of it as he was always giving us veiled threats. The exercise didn't actually start off that badly. The weather during the first day was gorgeous, very sunny, and for some reason, they didn't take this as an opportunity to make us do some running with Kit in the sun. That night, we settled into guard duty, and to explain, a basha is a hole dug in the ground you sleep in, so you and your basha mate will take a stag duty, which will last for about an hour. The guard duty itself involves you lying down in a camouflaged hole, dug especially for the guard duty. Then one of you will go next to the basha and tell them it's their turn and so on. At the end of our turn, I went to the basha and whispered it's their turn to stag on. A low voice with what sounded like a Scottish accent came from the shelter, aggressively telling me to go away. I didn't recognize the voice and thought to myself, Maybe the SAS thing is true. Maybe I can be a hero and capture Sergeant G's mates. Imagining what Sergeant G's face would be like in the morning when I reported that I single-handedly repelled the SAS attack, I cocked my SA-80 with a blank round and demanded whoever it is to show themselves. Silence. Angrily, I pulled back the poncho covering the basha to be greeted with what I could just see in the dark 
as Sergeant G's naked body. He was in the basha with one of the female recruits and must have put on a weird fake voice to throw me off. I stood stunned as a furious naked Sergeant G leapt to his feet, telling me not to say a fucking word about this and to get back on guard duty. I couldn't quite see how angry he was because it was dark, but I could hear the fury in his voice. I now was on his radar. He was married. I now was a witness to him sleeping with some woman whilst on an exercise, and I knew he would have to do something about this. The next morning, things seemed to go okay. Sergeant G didn't even acknowledge me, which suited me down to the ground, and the exercises carried on until the night. The weather this night wasn't like the night before. It was torrential, and I was assigned to third stag duty, which was around one I seemed to recall. Now, weirdly, I was told I had to stag on with this girl, who Sergeant G had slept with, which was odd as it meant my basha mate didn't have to do a guard duty. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't suspicious about this sudden change, but we carried on with guard duty, chatting in low voices, bored out of our minds as the rain hammered the waterproof material above. All of a sudden, I felt a tremendous weight crash through our canopy, right onto my back. Someone from behind grabbed the front of my helmet, and I feel what seemed to be a knife against my throat. Pulling my helmet tighter backwards, it felt like someone headbutting or hitting the back of my helmet with something. The person demanded I drop my rifle, in the same Scottish accent I'd heard the night before. Pulling me to my feet, he ushered me forward into the dark forest. Glancing down, I caught a glimpse of the girl I was on guard duty with, and I could see how terrified she was when we locked eyes for a moment. Then she carried on laying down with her hands behind her helmet. I remember stumbling through the woods for probably ten minutes in the pitch black, when the voice ordered me to lie down on the ground. Dropping down in what was a huge muddy puddle, I tried to keep my head up and face away from inches deep of foul muddy water. And the voice then demanded my name, rank, and number, which I gave to him. He replied he didn't believe me and he would shove my head into the puddle with what I assumed was his foot. Daring to look up slightly, I could see two pairs of boots, so I knew it must be Sergeant G and probably one of the corporals. They then started asking about how many people were in our platoon and who was in charge and other stuff like that, to which I obviously gave them all they wanted to know, being 16 and terrified of being alone in the woods with what I knew was Sergeant G. I didn't want to make him angry. This, of course, had the opposite effect. He gave me what felt like a punt to the right testicle as hard as he could, and the pain from this was excruciating. I felt like I wanted to throw up. Every instinct was to curl up into a fetal position, but they wouldn't allow me to. This carried on for a further 20 to 25 minutes, with them asking things like how great Sergeant G was or other corporals in the platoon, all the way to whom was the biggest slag in the platoon. No matter what answer I gave, I was met with violence. Kicks to my ribs and fingers trod on, and at one point what felt like a thin stick whipping the back of my thighs. Thankfully they got bored, or realized they couldn't carry on doing this without doing me serious damage. I was ordered to my feet and led back to the area our platoon was camped out at, and I was told to go ahead alone when fairly close. After retrieving my rifle from the girl who was on stag duty alone, she asked what happened. I always remember this as I didn't want to seem like a coward. I told her nothing had happened, they just asked me some questions. However, I was crying inside. All I wanted to do was go home to my mom, pathetic as it sounds, but I felt violated. The next morning was the end of the exercise. Sergeant G gathered everyone. After some debriefing, mainly about how bad we'd done, he then announced his mates from the SAS reported they'd interrogated a few people, all while staring at me the whole time. The whole march back, 
All I could think of was how he was going to get me now everyone knew what he was like, and without a doubt, I would be targeted by him. Now the misery was unbearable. I wanted the march to last longer because at least everyone was present and he couldn't single me out. We got back to camp and everyone set about cleaning gear when I was told the officer wanted to see me. My heart leapt, thinking maybe the girl had reported what had happened and that it would save me, and in a way, it did. The officer informed me that there were enough people to form a training troop at St. Omer, passing out from Purbright, so I would be leaving at the end of the week. Thankfully, I managed to avoid Sergeant G for the whole week. I volunteered to set up the field for RLC day and was under the supervision of a different sergeant. Thank God. So that's it. My epic tale of deep cut barracks. As mentioned at the start, I tried to let the tribunal know of what occurred. They did not want to know. This man affected me in such a way that I still have reoccurring nightmares that I've rejoined the army and he's going to get his revenge. And as for Sergeant G, don't worry about him, boys and girls. He got his just desserts for all the years of torment that he doled out to vulnerable young soldiers. The army recognized this and promoted him. He's now the officer in charge of recruit welfare in the British Army. This I wish was a lie, but it isn't. I landed in Bangalore a while ago. When coming out of the airport, there was a bit of a drizzle. The Bangalore weather that I've come to love, although the last time I lived here was in 2005. I remember, even then, it used to rain almost every day. I was waiting for my ride to pick me up. Someone standing next to me muttered, All these people come from God knows where, and no one speaks a word of Canada. Ironically enough, the gentleman made this remark in English. I recall something that happened in 2005 that all very vividly came back to me on a long, bumpy taxi ride to my hotel. So, in 2005, I lived in a small one-bedroom house on the ground floor. The occupants of the floor above me were the landlord, his young son, and the landlord's youngest brother, Manju. Manju asked me in Canada if I could speak the language. That was the first question he asked me when I moved in. I'm a computer graduate too, he said, but he said it in English for my benefit, I guess. I smiled, my trademark migrant work a sheepish smile. Over the next few months, I realized Manju basically did not have a day job. He'd bomb cigarettes off me and would always ask me, where would you guys be if it wasn't for Bangalore? I had a great rapport with the landlord though. He had a bad back and requested me to give him the spare key to my house so that they could get the gas cylinder delivered to my place, and later the domestic help would pick it up and lug it all the way to the floor above. Later in 2005, I applied for the high-skilled migrant program to Europe. It involved a lot of documentation. Manju was very curious about the whole process, and I tried my best to explain how the process actually works. So, the application was successful. I quit my job and then start making preparations to move. The landlord's kid was insistent that I download some Adobe Flash games for him to play on his home computer before I go. I copy it onto a USB drive. I give the USB drive to him. He says he doesn't know how to copy them and asks me to do it for him. The computer was in Manju's room. I stick the USB drive in. The thumbnail of the desktop catches my eye. A very familiar picture. I double click. It's a picture of my girlfriend. My Chinese wife is written over it in bold comic sans. She was actually from India. Also on the desktop are scanned copies of my bank account statements and degree certificate. A couple of the statements were badly edited where Manju's name was put in place of mine. It wouldn't have fooled anyone, but Manju had put his MS paint skills to the best of his abilities. I cursed myself for my carelessness. Having left all my documents on my work desk, 
not realizing even Manju had access to the spare key to let himself in. I call my landlord and tell him what happened. He was profusely apologetic and tells me he'll set Manju straight. I have about three days before I fly away to Europe. I delete the pictures from his desktop. Not satisfied, I climb down the stairs, come back armed with a CD of Ubuntu Linux. I wipe the hard drive and fresh install Linux on their desktop. Geek revenge when I've less than 72 hours to spare. The night before I have to fly, I hear loud banging on the door. I open it. There's Manju and another friend of his. His eyes met me with hate. He sees I have four of my friends who stayed over to see me off and help with the luggage. Good luck, he says before he vanishes. And I haven't seen him since. So, about nine years ago, my boyfriend, now husband, and myself were driving cross-country from California to Florida. My husband had an enormous roddy named Kuma. I'd only just met Kuma two days prior, since my husband and I were in a long-distance relationship at the time, so I didn't know the dog quite well. But he was a great boy and talked a lot. We called them Umble Grumbles. We stopped at a gas station so that we could all get out, stretch, and use the restrooms. He got Kuma on his leash and he said he'd take him for a walk. I offered to do it instead since I didn't need to use the restroom urgently. Now, I'm not a small girl. I'm five foot ten, but I am petite, as my husband calls me, maybe 125 pounds. My husband is almost six foot five and built like a Viking so a dog Kuma's size wouldn't affect him one way or another if he tried to bolt chasing a squirrel or something. I, on the other hand, will admit I was nervous once he handed me the leash to hold him, because if he tried to do anything, I wasn't big or strong enough to stop him. My husband noticed my nervousness. He just smiled and said, Don't worry, he's well trained. He won't take off and he won't let anything happen to you. It's important to take note that Kuma had no formal protection training. He just loved whatever his dad did and knew he was supposed to protect and keep it safe when his dad wasn't there to do it himself. Once he was sure I was comfortable, my husband headed inside, leaving Kuma and I near the far right side of the gas station with a little dirt path near a wooded area. It was very dark and there was little light being shed so far from the building but it was a busy little gas station. I could see people, so I didn't feel isolated or anything. I start to walk slowly, allowing Kuma to take in his surroundings when I hear a noise coming from behind me. I turned, startled to see a man walking. He notices me and slows his gait. He looks around and then back at me, and then he smiles eerily. Oh no. He changes direction suddenly, heading directly towards me. He says, It's awful dangerous out here alone. Are you alone? Something in his eyes told me to run. Just as I'm about to bolt and start hustling towards the people and lights of the station, I hear another sound. This one is new to me. As I clenched my hand, preparing to run or die fighting this creepy man, I felt something. The leash. It was Kuma. In that moment, I'd forgotten that I wasn't alone at all, not by a long shot. The sound I heard was a warning, a very lethal one. It was the deepest, most menacing growl I've ever heard come out of anything. That beautiful beast stepped out from behind me, where he'd been observing the threat, like a giant dragon rising from the shadows. A man's creepy shadow slipped right off of his face, as did a few shades of color. Kuma placed his large body between mine and the approaching stranger and pressed his back against me, urging me towards the jeep. He didn't have to tell me twice. I turned and started to make my way back to the car, 
still holding the leash for dear life. He walked backward, pressed against me the whole time, watching my back until we made it back to where we had parked. I tried to look for the man, but he either ran away to wherever he'd come from or made it inside, taking a much longer route, well outside of Kuma's reach. I told my husband what happened, and honestly, I'm not sure who would have done more damage to that unfortunate man had they located him. Every day for the next nine years, Kuma was my best friend and guardian. Rest in peace, baby boy. I'm from Connecticut. I was in a long-distance relationship with a girl from Georgia and would often make road trips down to visit her. I don't really mind. I love road trips. I've driven across the United States and back, all on my own. There's just something about traveling the highways of the US by yourself that's just so freeing. To save money, I would sleep in my car. It's not so bad. It's basically camping, in a metal tent. It makes you feel like you're really roughing it. I just recline the seat back, keep the key in ignition just in case, and doze off. And no, I don't put anything up to block the windows for privacy. Maybe I should have. The trip down south is a comfortable two-day drive. My stop would usually be somewhere along the Virginia-North Carolina border. So for my previous trip, that's exactly where I stopped that night. Rest stops were often less trafficked and thus quieter than truck stops. Normally I would have stopped at Love's, but I was so tired that I settled for the first rest stop that I saw. It was oddly vacant that night, with only a couple of lone cars sitting forlorn under the amber street lamps, most likely travelers with the same idea as myself. I pulled into a parking spot away from the others under the shadow of a tree and far from the street lamps. I figured I would have more privacy there as opposed to being bathed in light. So, I did my usual thing. Locked my doors, opened the window just a hair for ventilation, kept my key in, reclined the seat, and went to sleep. I was never interrupted on any of these car camping nights, so I never suspected anything on this one. Then a sharp tap woke me up. At first, I thought I heard it in my dream. I opened my eyes a bit confused. Since I was leant back, I was facing the ceiling and couldn't see anything. I heard another tap. It was like a tiny object hitting a hard surface. It came in an irregular rhythm. Was it raining? Was water dropping onto my windshield? I'm under a tree. Maybe something fell from the branches. Maybe a squirrel or bird was dropping something. What if a squirrel was climbing around my car? Or what if it wasn't an animal? The thought occurred to me that it might very well be a person poking around outside. What did they want? Were the doors locked? Yes. The keys were in the ignition. I can leave in an instant. Still, I lay there, completely still, pretending to be asleep pretending I hadn't heard anything, hoping whoever it was that they would leave me alone. I was better not to find out. I was too afraid to find out. It was better to stay here in blissful ignorance. Still, the tapping continued. I had to do something. There was no way I was just going to stay there. I had to look. My heart was pounding. In that moment, it was definitely loud. Whoever was out there could probably hear it. I decided I was going to look. I was going to raise my head up and see what was making the noise. So that's what I did. What met my eyes set a jolt through my entire body. Every muscle fiber locked up in pure shock at what I saw. The faint glow of the street lamps cast just enough light for me to make out what I was looking at. There in the windshield, staring directly at me, was a face. Someone, I presumed to be a woman, was lying on my hood. Her face pressed right up against my windshield. 
Her face was completely still, locked in a permanent grin. I froze in overwhelming terror. The eyes I stared into appeared to have rolled back, showing only the whites. Her nose was turned up, pressed painfully into the glass. Her lips stretched wide, revealing horrible, rotten teeth. Even in the darkness, I could tell her skin was sickly pale, contrasting her long, filthy, black hair. Whoever this was, she was clearly not in her right mind. I don't know how long I sat there, too afraid to move. Finally, I got a grip over myself and shot my hand over the ignition. It turned over, making, in that instant, the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. I reversed as fast as I could, trying not to give this creeper time to do anything. In my panic, I remember activating the windshield wipers in a futile attempt to get her off. I thought, was I about to drive out of here with some wacko holding onto my hood? Thankfully, I didn't have to worry about that, because as soon as I stopped, the woman leapt off, landing on all fours. Seeing my opportunity, I shifted into drive and gunned it, right as I saw her reaching for the driver's side door. With my foot on the gas, I sped out of that parking lot, behind me. I heard her let out a piercing shriek like that of an animal. I looked in my rearview mirror, and for a split second, I thought I saw her chasing me. Running on all fours, her black hair swinging wildly around her. I couldn't get a good look as I rounded a curve in the road, leading out of the rest stop and merging with the highway. There, I picked up speed and drove through the night. I did not dare stop again until I saw the morning light. I'm a 21 year old guy. One Friday two years ago, I was headed to the beach where my friends had already arrived. It's about a seven hour drive from where I live and I was alone. At about the 2 hour 30 mark into the trip, I wanted to pull over to stretch my legs and take a break, since I could tell I was stiffening up and losing focus. I pulled out onto a highway rest stop and parked in the shade next to some trees. The rest stop was almost completely empty, other than a white SUV and a couple of trucks with sleeping drivers in them. I had no rush to arrive, since I'd be there too late to join my friends that night regardless so I figured I'd chill there for a bit. I brought some pot along and had Lord of the Rings on my laptop, so I set myself up to relax for an hour or so. After about five minutes, I noticed a man walking towards my car. He was probably in his mid-forties to early fifties, bald, overweight, and his face was hidden by a mask. As he was walking towards me, I noticed he was staring intently at me. I avoided eye contact at first, then lit up and started watching my movie. He then walked right up to my window, which was rolled down, and he said hi. In my mind, I'm thinking, screw it, I'm traveling sort of, and I love having a meeting people mentality when I travel, so I indulged him in some small talk, things like what I did for work and what I studied, those kind of things. Here's where things start to get weird. This is how our conversation goes. So, are you looking for something to do around here? A lot of people come here looking for plans. The guy inquired. What do you mean? This is a random highway rest stop in the middle of nowhere. What the hell else do people come here if not to rest or eat? I asked. Sex, he said. Excuse me? Yeah. People come here to mess around. Are you looking for something like that? At this point, I'm starting to get uncomfortable. Uh, no, I'm not really interested, I said to him. What about you and your friends? Do you plan things like that? You planning on something this weekend? Not really. We usually just go out to have fun and... If something happens, we pat the guy who got laid on the back, I say 
nervously laughing at my own joke. What about between you and your friends? He asked. It was already obvious me and all my friends I was planning to go to the beach with were male. I laugh, praying he was joking. No, not at all. I'm completely straight. Nothing wrong with it. Just not my cup of tea. At this point, I noticed that every few seconds, the conversation would stop dead, and in the awkward silence, I saw he was looking over at the white SUV where there were two more guys his age, one leaning on the driver's side door, and one sitting shotgun. You know, my co-worker has a son your age. He tells me guys your age are open to try anything. Here's when I realize what's really going on. Clearly this guy was pressuring me to have sex with him or something, right there in the rest stop. Maybe even rob me while he's at it. It hadn't crossed my mind that I was in actual danger, since I'm a 6 foot 4, well built guy, and not usually the target for robberies or sexual assault. Yeah, no sorry, I'm completely sure I'm fully straight. What you got there? Is that rolling tobacco? He asks. Yeah, I reply. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I can smell something else. He tells me. Maybe. Are you smoking pot to get your inhibitions down? The guy proceeds. Nope. I quickly retort back. So are you sure you're not looking for any plans around here? By this point, I couldn't take it anymore. The only thing keeping me from just speeding off was that I felt relatively safe inside my locked car and the other two guys were pretty far away and I'm polite to a fault so it felt rude. However, I noticed that the guy that was leaning on the SUV start to walk toward my car too. I just told the guy I had a long road ahead and had to head out. I rolled up my window and hightailed it out of there. The guy just stepped back as I drove off and stared at me. I could see him staring as I pulled into the highway through my rearview mirror. I'm pretty sure I was just sexually harassed. It felt disgusting. I'm scared to think of what might have happened if I'd been out of my car. And I'm even more disgusted now that I realize that women probably go through experiences like that way more often than men do and they can probably do a lot less about it than we can. There's some weirdos out there, guys. Stay safe, please. This incident occurred in spring three years ago. Let me set the scene and give a bit of backstory. I was driving to Minnesota to Iowa for a music festival and decided to leave Thursday night because number one, I generally prefer road tripping at night, less vehicles on the road and that kind of thing. And number two, I wanted to get to the festival grounds as early as possible to secure a good camping spot. All is going well. I'm about two hours away from Des Moines and I realize I really gotta pee. Now, For those of you unfamiliar with driving long, mostly rural interstate highways, rest stations can be a godsend when the gas stations are few and far between. So I see a sign for a rest area coming up in two miles. Perfect. I pull in and there's maybe three other cars in the lot. Things are generally quiet and on first glance, nothing seems out of the ordinary or anything. However, I have just a general feeling of unease as I pull into park, and I'm not one to ignore my intuitive reaction to things. I really just have to go to the bathroom. Luckily, my little brother had just given me this badass little taser, cause he knows how often I like to go adventuring in various wooded areas and whatnot, usually at night, and he wants me to be safe. So, I grab it quick, just in case and I run in to use the bathroom. Not 30 seconds after I close my store door, I hear someone yelling either babe or a name, but it's unintelligible. 
just the way they were hollering made them sound unstable. At this point, my heart starts beating pretty fast, and I'm just hoping he leaves the general building. But no, I hear the main door to the women's restroom get kicked open, and of course, he comes to the only stall door that's shut and starts kind of mumble yelling something I can't make out. And I just said, in my sternest voice possible, Dude, what the fuck? He finally says something I can make out. I'm looking for my fucking girlfriend. So I said, You don't know me. Get the fuck out. And he proceeds to ask me my name. Seriously. The guy is clearly not in his right mind, and at this point, he starts shaking the stall door. So I turned on the taser and repeated, Get out, before hitting the little button that makes the taser do its thing. Luckily, as I hoped, just the sound of it was enough for him to quickly and repeatedly apologize as he backed his way out of the bathrooms. I just sat there for like 10 minutes as I regained control of my composure and then quickly walked out to my vehicle taser at the ready, and booked it out of there immediately. This happened in May of 2003. Sometimes when I'm on a trip, I go down rural roads just to see what's around. I took some rural road in the Florida Panhandle to see the scenery. I drove for about an hour just going down different roads without really knowing where I was. It was around lunchtime. I drove to this park which was pretty to look at and started eating lunch at this picnic table which was close to my car. I had the car door window open on the passenger side and had a boombox which was playing a cassette tape of old music from the 1970s and 80s. I was singing along to the music and slowly eating my lunch. I had finished half my sandwich and had eaten some chips. I happened to turn around and saw this man who looked like and dressed similar to Dog the Bounty Hunter. For a split second, I actually thought he was Dog the Bounty Hunter and then realized he wasn't. I gasped when I saw this guy and for about 30 seconds had fear as he was standing right behind me. He had told me that he'd seen me drive into the park. He waited to see how long it was before I saw him. He told me that he had stood there for several minutes before I noticed him and apologized for frightening me. This made my hair go up on end. At the same time though, I didn't feel threatened by this guy, as I knew if he wanted to hurt me, he would have done so. I remember just having a look of shock and disbelief and didn't say anything to him as he talked. He told me that the park was a dangerous place to be because of drug dealing and other criminal activities, and he knew that I wasn't aware of this due to being from out of town. He also knew I wasn't the type of person who hung out with this type of crowd. For my own personal safety, he said that I needed to leave the park immediately. I nodded and then I picked up my half-eaten sandwich and chips and put them into my lunch bag. I put that into my vehicle got in and rolled up the window, locked all the doors and got out of there quickly. I looked in my rear view mirror a couple of times, just to make sure no one followed me. Once I could get back onto I-10, I did. Then I finished my lunch. I often wondered who this guy was. My guess is that he was some undercover police officer who was trying to protect me from harm. He probably ran my license plate, which is how he knew I wasn't from the Panhandle area. When I go on trips now, I'm more careful not to go into a park where there is no one around. It's not really safe. My partner and I decided we were going to go hiking on a trail in a national forest area yesterday. It's a fairly remote area, and we drove a variety of dirt roads to get there, but we were excited to hike during a beautiful time of year with the leaves changing. The trailhead had a small parking area, which was approximately 200 feet before a river crossing and bridge. 
As we pulled into the parking area, we noticed a line of about five people on the other side of the river embankment across the bridge. They were all standing in a neutral stance, either facing our direction or the opposite direction, with their feet nearly touching. It was difficult to tell with the stance. There was maybe a slight gap in the road for a car to pass through, but they took up most of the road. They were wearing all black, and it looked like they might have had black masks on as well, as we couldn't see any color or features indicative of faces. As we pulled into the parking area, my partner and I pondered what was going on over there. We stared at them for about 10 seconds, and we discovered that they were completely motionless, like statues. At that point, both of our guts were raising alarms, and we decided to hightail it out of there. As we drove away, they continued to stand there, motionless. Thankfully, nobody followed us. We're still trying to figure out what happened there. Was it a hunting group? If so, why weren't they wearing orange? Was it a teenage group playing a prank? Was it just our overactive imaginations? Just as a friendly reminder, there's a problem of people disappearing in national parks and forests, so be sure to stay safe and vigilant. I was heading up to Clear Lake, California to visit my dad when he lived in Glenhaven, a sleepy little burg on the east side of the lake. I drove up from San Jose super early in the morning to try and get there around 5 or 6 in the morning so we could go fishing. I hadn't seen my dad in a few years, we were never really close, but I thought to try and reconnect with him again. I drove up 80 to 505 and then cut down to 16, which eventually leads to 20 and onto Clear Lake. Just for some reference, 16 cuts through several small towns and sidles up along Cache Creek until it dead ends at 20. It's also dark as fuck outside of the little towns. Somewhere near Valley Vista Regional Park, I came across a strange scene. It was about 3 a.m. There was a slight curve to the right coming up ahead probably about a quarter mile. On the other side of the road at the curve, I could see a bunch of cars parked haphazardly in the dirt between the road and the creek. The closer I got, I could see people standing around the cars. No lights, no fires, no flashlights. Just about 10 to 15 people standing around their cars in complete darkness with the exception of my headlights. As I got closer to a couple of the people, from the shape, appearing male, started coming into the road and waving their arms for me to stop. I was tired, couldn't make them out clearly, in an unfamiliar territory, with a bunch of people standing around in complete darkness, trying to get me to pull over. I noped out of there with a quickness. I had a cell phone, but out there I had no reception, and I didn't call the cops once I did. It just felt all wrong, and I've always had good instincts. It still gives me the heebie-jeebies looking back all these years later. Hey guys. I hope you enjoyed that one. I'd like to thank my channel members and patrons for the support. Ryan, Wendy, ADHD Aurora, Brooke, Snowball Rathena, Janice, Dez, Borderline Betty, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Stacy, Greg, Chelsea, 
Amanda Jane, Samantha, Zepp, Sarah C, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Erin, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I will see you on the next one.